All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. So we'll start off with the word of prayer and we'll jump right in. Dear Lord, thank you very much for uh, today. Thank you for all your many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to uh, be here today. Um, thank you for everything that we have to gather around. Thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, who you are, Lord. Uh, we ask now that you would uh, please bless this Sunday school lesson. Pray that you help me to teach it. I pray that you would uh, help with everything that's going on today. Pray that you would bless the preachings later today with uh, Kyle and Brother Mikey. I pray that uh, you'd bless those who are traveling right now, who are on the way here or who are out and about. Pray for Pastor and uh, his wife and their travel mercies. Pray for uh, soul winning opportunities. And I pray for um, everything else that I'm forgetting to mention right now, Lord. I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Uh, all right, so we have this morning a study on the characteristics of God. And I usually, in the last most recent studies, I've been qualifying it before I open up and telling you why I'm doing it. Uh, with, with this one, with the characteristics of God, it's, it's kind of commonplace that people, there's some confusion surrounding who God is. Uh, there's people who will come up with bizarre stuff. There's people who will miss out some pretty important elements of, of the character of God. And this, I'm not, I don't know if I'm going to get to the end of it today because there's uh, quite a lot, and it's not even an exhaustive study on the characteristics of God. There's, there's more to it than, than what I'm going to be talking about today. But furthermore, there's the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. There's the characteristics of Jesus Christ. Uh, we're only going to be talking about God today, which they are a trinity, so there is a lot of carryover between each of the members of the Trinity, but we're just going to be hitting on characteristics of God today. So I'm going to start off with something called the incommunicable, incommunicable attributes, which these are attributes that cannot be communicated to humans, which we are created beings of, a, of an uncreated being. So there's things that by nature we're not going to be able to fully understand. We can kind of get an idea about it, but we're not going to be able to fully wrap our heads around certain things. So the first couple attributes are going to be these incommunicable attributes. And we have a lot of different references we're going to be flipping around to today. So uh, some of them I'll tell you, let's flip there. Some of them I'll say, let's not. Uh, there's a lot of them here, but uh, it'll keep everybody awake here this morning. So uh, in pastor's absence here, we'll try to give you something good. So... Uh, the first point I want to make is uh, the characteristic is God is eternal. Uh, this means that God didn't have a beginning and he doesn't have an end. Uh, that's something that's hard for us to wrap our minds around as, as human beings who know about beginnings and know about ends. We're constrained by time. Uh, God isn't constrained by time because he created time. It is near impossible for us humans to comprehend how this can be or what exactly it means. This is because we, like I said, are constrained by time. Time is linear. Time is measurable. Uh, time, by us humans, cannot be transverse, no matter how many times uh, these scientists like Albert Einstein or whoever else might try to make a time machine. Nobody's figured it out. Uh, as much as scientists try to play God, uh, nobody's figured out this one yet, how to, how to get this one on God to say we are, we are like God, as, uh, as Satan said will be like the most high, uh, will transverse time as well. For the creator of time, uh, God exists outside of time. Uh, in the Bible, he stepped in and out of time. Uh, he can appear anywhere he wants in there. And uh, we've seen Jesus do it. Uh, there's the something called the pre-incarnate uh, 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 incarnates of Christ. There's the theophanies, the, the incarnates of God uh, throughout the Bible also. Uh, so, as he pleases, he can step in and out, out of it. Uh, people who are God-haters, who are God-rejectors, they'll numb their brain to appease themselves by believing that uh, God's creation exists eternally with no start to it. You know, they'll say, uh, you know, you get into the, the Big Bang and all that, and uh, there, there's all these ways you can go about it, but uh, you, you can't pin these people against the wall. It's like... It's like pinning jello to a wall. 
It's uh, you, you say, all right, so what created that uh, the Big Bang? And oh, it's it's this or it's that or it's uh, they'll go to it's, it's aliens or we're in a simulation or they, you, you can't pin them down because they just keep coming up with new stuff to try to uh, back themselves up. And as we know, science is uh, it's, it's, it's constantly changing the science that the world, you know, makes the science is always changing. Um, you know, this takes more faith uh, to to believe that. Um, and it's, the faith is applied to the wrong thing. You could use a little amount of faith and apply it to the right thing based on what you can see. The Bible says that, uh, you know, creation is, 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 is God's creation is, is the evidence of the creator. No man is going to be without excuse. Um, and the devil, he's, he's very crafty and he knows how to, uh, swindle the, the hearts of man. Um, he's devised his own knockoff model, and he's playing off of the rebellion of, uh, of, of the nature of man. Uh, the man by nature is rebellious and wants to throw off God. And here you have uh, the devil making up his own, his own model to get you to apply faith onto that. So he always has everything upside down. Um, and that's why there's such emphasis on protecting your mind. Um, even Christians can have their own vulnerable, fragile minds swindled without them even knowing. Um, you can start believing things that aren't true, that obviously there's only one truth. God is truth. The Bible is truth. And uh, you can have people, Christians, uh, be uh, carried about by every wind of doctrine, it says, in, in the end times that we're living in right now. Uh, and, you know, they won't even know it. They'll think it's truth, and they won't even realize that the father of lies is the author of, of, of some of these lies. Um, that'll do it for the uh, eternal characteristics of God. Uh, the second one I want to talk about is God is unchanging. Um, so we have in Malachi 3.6. That one might be a little hard to turn to, so I'll just I'll, I'll read it for you. Uh, Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Uh, the next one, we can go to James 1. James 1, 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So we, we have uh, two points here about his un, unchangingness. There's no variable in this. There's no variableness in him, which means he's not going to vary. He doesn't have his, his, his foot in two different places. He's, he's straightforward with what he does. He doesn't vary. And there's neither a shadow of turning. So there's not even a question uh, about what the Lord... Uh, about his, 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 what he's going to say he's going to do or who he is. There's not even a thought that he'd be anything other than what he is. And, 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 and that's the no shadow, no shadow of turning there. We have Exodus chapter 32. Let's turn there. Exodus 32, and we'll start in verse 10. And we'll read down to 14. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. So uh, before I get into the rest of the little passage here, I want to read uh, for context. This is when Moses was receiving the Ten Commandments up on the mountain. And uh, when he was when he was up there, God was saying, "Hey, you know, look look what's going on over there right now." And it was the Israelites making a golden image, the golden calf, and they were worshiping it and and making sacrifices onto it. And uh, the Lord was was very displeased by what he saw, and uh, he was having a back and forth here with Moses. So that's why God is saying here, He says, "Let me alone, that I may wax hot against them." and that I may consume them. 
And then he says, and I will make of thee a great nation. Uh, we don't have to read the whole passage here, but the point I want to make on this year with the unchangingness of God is that when God commits himself to, to something, he, he's going to do it. Um, but this is the one passage, or there's actually another one I'm going to take us to, that the, uh, um, the Lord, uh, if you're familiar with it, the Lord says that he repented of the evil that he thought to do. So the Lord repented, that means he, he changed, right? Well, yes, he, he, he changed what he thought to do, the evil that he thought to do, but it's not changing his character or what he said he was going to do. So when the Lord says he's going to do something, he commits himself to it, he's going to do it. Uh, but here he's saying that he, 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 he's having a back and forth with Moses, and it almost appears that Moses has the power here to, 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 to dictate what is going to happen with the back and forth, and Moses reminds him, hey, remember you, what you were going to do here, Moses said, you're going to make a great nation out of, out of Abraham. Uh, why are you going to wipe these guys out? So uh, he was saying that he's, this is the back and forth. His mind was not set. He did not commit to it. In other words, he's telling Moses, hey, get out of my way. Stop, stop uh, negotiating with me. I, I want to do this. He didn't say, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to do this. And then furthermore, um, he makes what uh, we see a conditional promise here, like he made to Abraham. He made a number of conditional promises, which means I promise. He said, I'm going, I will, I will do this if you do this. So there's plenty of those with Abraham. And this one right here, he says, you know, let, basically get out of my way and I will make of thee a great nation, he said to Moses. So since Moses actually talked down the Lord out of wiping them out, uh, he didn't get this conditional promise. Otherwise, you know, the Bible would be very different. Um, he could have, Moses would have said, uh, if he would have been like how it was later in the passage, uh, they were negotiating, and then they went back and forth, and then they, they flopped roles. Uh, Moses was saying, wipe them out, and then the Lord was saying, no, I'm not going to wipe them out. So uh, if he would have taken that stance back here, Moses would have been the one that would have been the father of, of Israel. He would have been... Uh, you know, essentially the, the patriarch like, like Abraham was that the great nation came out from. So the Lord doesn't change. Um, and that's a, uh, a proof right there. Um, we see in Romans chapter 11, verse 29, it says, For the gifts and callings of, of God are without repentance. So what God has planned for you and, and called you to do, he will not change his mind about. Uh, if he's giving you a gift, and he's giving you the calling, and uh, no mistake about it, that that was the Lord doing that, and it wasn't uh, you thinking it was and it wasn't. He's not going to change and take back that gift or take back that calling. It might be so that, you know, maybe you enter the missions field for a time, and he takes you out for a time. Well, that was part of the plan, um, or whatever you want to apply the scenario to. That was the plan, but he's not going to change his mind once he puts you where he wants you. Um, for the sake of just changing his mind and saying, oh, well, it looks like actually I, I made the wrong decision. You shouldn't have been there, you know. Um, everything's done for his glory for those that love him, the Bible says. Uh, the next point we're going to get to is uh, the omnipotence of God. Uh, it's a fancy way of saying the all-powerfulness. Uh, God is all-powerful. Um Anyone who believes that God is who he says he is and has a fear of the Lord can easily grasp this one. Um, it's, it's easy to know if you're God-fearing. The reason why you're God-fearing is because God's all-powerful. Um, he, he could do whatever he wants. He could, he could stomp you out if he wanted to at any given moment. Um, that's, that's where some of the fear of the Lord stems from. Um, if God was not all-powerful, uh, how could he be in control? Uh, God would not be in control of his creation if he did not have full power and full control over his creation. He would be subject to his creation. He, he wouldn't be God. He wouldn't be in control if that was the case. Uh, God's word uh, carries unmatched power. Uh, we know in the, the narrative of Genesis in chapter 1 that uh, by God's word was everything created. Um, that's the all-powerfulness of, of, of just his word alone, that he can create just, just with his word. 
we see in, a, in Hebrews chapter 11, you can turn there. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3 says, uh, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So we understand that the worlds, that's the heavens and the earth, were framed by the word of God. So God can create something out of nothing. Um, something that science even recognizes is something that's not possible. Even science says that something has to come from something, even though they contradict themselves and you say, how did everything come to be? And they'll say, oh, it was just there or something. Um, but I, I think it was one of Newton's laws or something that um, matter has to come from matter. Energy has to come from, you know, from something. It doesn't just appear uh, when you make equations. But... Uh, and they exclude the truth in all of their equations and computations. Uh, the truth is, is that God did create something out of nothing, and they fail to mention that. Uh, that'll do it for the omnipotence of God. Um, actually, let's go a little further here. Um, there's some logical fallacies around the omnipotence of God. So I mentioned on the uh, logical fallacies. Uh, it's something good to study if you're into uh, Christian apologetics and to defending your faith. Um, when you are talking to somebody who's not saved or somebody who wants to argue doctrine with you, uh, a lot of times they bring up something called a logic fallacy, which means they try to present a picture, but there's a hole in their logic somewhere. So it's going to lead to false conclusions because they're not being honest and true with what they're presenting to make a, a valid argument, um, a valid debate. Um, there's one of them, it might be a, a, a a, one of the more famous ones that people might recognize. It's the logic fallacy about, uh, can God create a boulder so big that he cannot move it? Uh, and that's the uh, unstoppable force meets an immovable force, right? Uh, that's, that's, that, that's a logical fallacy. Um, you cannot put God into a box and constrain him with our rationale, our thinking as humans. Uh, God was doing just fine. Like I said, God's an eternal being. He was doing just fine for a whole eternity before we showed up on, on the scene here. Um, and he's going to do just fine, you know, even while we are here, uh, despite man's attempts to uh, try to poke holes in, in who he is and, and God's nature. Um you know, before our, 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 our gray matter little minds showed up, um, the God of the universe always was. And uh, we think we can outthink God, and we can't. Uh, our minds were created by God, and um, what do they say? We only use a certain percent of our brain, which is already however big it is, you know. Um, we are the ones who are constrained by the limits of our minds and can only think about what we are able to think about. Uh, for perspective, I want to give an example about um, there's something called the uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, um, which is in itself, it's theoretically infinite. Uh, that's where they say where, you know, we can only see a certain amount of visible light. You know, the rainbow, Roy G. Bibb, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, indigo violet. Um, we can't see ultraviolet. We can't see X-rays. We can't see UV rays. Um, we've invented tools and instruments where we can see it and we can interact with it. And we can use these spectrums, like on airplanes, we use uh, high-frequency and ultra-high-frequency radios, and uh, we're able to interact with these spectrums that otherwise would be invisible. We wouldn't even know they existed. Um, and further than the visible light is the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, we, I think science says we can only do less than a percent of what's on there. Uh, that's because we're not equipped with the tools. We don't have you know, the sensors and everything. Uh, we're not made with that. I think one day our eyes are going to be open. We can interact with the rest of the spectrum. You know, God made it. Um, it does exist. And uh, we, we, we're, we're so finite that we can only do a little bit of it right now. And um, even the spectrum itself is theoretically infinite because you can get down to the microscopic and then the micro-microscopic and 
you know, the Lord can see down that, that small. Uh, we can say, oh, hey, we found the nano. And it's like, hey, go a step further. There's the super nano or something. So there, it's theoretically infinite what we cannot see, um, how, how deep we can go into that. Um, and I, I, I'm using this as an example to say we cannot uh, uh, constrain God to say, hey, there's a gray line here where you pass this number and there's a certain number of mass, a certain pound that the Lord cannot lift. Uh, that, that doesn't make sense. God, God, God is, is, is infinite. You can't say based on what we know to be mass and, and all that, uh, that we can't, we can't pin God down to this. We can't put him in a corner with that. Um, Colossians 1.16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So we're not going to say that these things that were created by him and for him, that he's constrained by it. They were made for him. Why would he make something that he has no control over? We went over that on, on the last point. So uh, the next one's going to be the omnipresence. So we'll move off of omnipotence. We'll go on to omnipresence. That means God is everywhere at the same time. His presence is everywhere. And there's Bible to back that up. That's Psalms chapter 139. You don't find these words, these, these big uh, words in the Bible, but the concept of what they are, we, we, do, we do see. So we have Psalms chapter 139, and we'll start in verse 7. The Bible says, Whether shall I go from thy spirit, or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. So uh, here we have where the presence of God is, is, is everywhere. Um, there, there's plenty of verses where God says that he fills heaven and earth. Um, God is everywhere. Um, you get this new age thing where God is, is everything, you know. Um, I'm not going to go too far into that one, but um, we, have, we, we have Bible that says his presence is everywhere. Um, we see in verse 8, this is a little bit of a, I don't know if it might raise an eyebrow, um, that the psalmist here says that if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. And um, I would say that God isn't suffering in hell. You know, Jesus went to hell for a short duration. And there's some heresies that say that he wasn't there and that um, he did not have to go there and... That's part of salvation there, my friend, is that he did go there. Um, here we have it, though, that, that God, his presence is there. Um, and I would say that God isn't suffering in hell. And um, we can see that the eyes of, of God cannot look upon, upon hell. And that's, uh, we won't turn there, it's going to be another hard reference, but Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13 says, Thou art of purer eyes, than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. So the eyes of God cannot look at evil and iniquity, but it says that his presence is there. And um, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, we can turn there. Hebrews 1, 3 says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. That's also to my point, my last point about the uh, omnipotence, the word of his power. Uh, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Um, here we see uh, all things are upheld by the word of his power. So uh, hell is a created place. Uh, it says that hell is created for, uh, for, for, for Lucifer and for the fallen angels. Um, it's a created place. And everything that is created is created by the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord is what upholds all things that are created. So hell is being upheld right now uh, by the word of the Lord. 
And uh, this one isn't uh, really Bible. You know, hell, hell is a literal place in the Bible. Um, and I, I, I'm not going to teach this one as Bible, but I would say I think that, um, you know, kind of like how The Matrix was, the movie The Matrix, that they might be onto something there, how people could look at a screen and they could see every little bit of data. They could tell what color hair somebody has and all this just by looking at these little strings of data that are everywhere. Um, you know, uh, maybe the Lord, uh, you know, he is some sort of super quantum computer that he can see all these details of everything at all times. And uh, his eyes don't have to look on hell per se directly to know what's going on in there. His word is upholding it and he could, you know, see what's going on in there. He knows the data of it because he's upholding it with his word and all things that are in it. So um, maybe that's the way that that God here can see uh, somebody makes their bed in hell that uh, the Lord is there uh, per se. Um, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, uh, Jesus speaking, uh, are, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father. So that's him saying, hey, you know, God even sees when a bird falls from a tree, even if it's in the middle of a remote jungle that nobody sees, you know, uh, if a tree falls in the woods, does it make a noise? Uh, the Lord says yes. You know, the Lord sees everything. The Lord, the Lord is there. Uh, just because we don't see it and we don't log it as you know a, a data that we saw or heard with our, our, on our own doesn't mean it didn't happen. The Lord is everywhere. He sees everything. And uh, further to that point is Jeremiah chapter twenty-three, verse twenty-four. The Bible says, "Can any hide himself in secret places?" that I shall not see him, saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord. There you have it. He fills heaven and earth, and there's no secret place in his creation that you can go to that the Lord isn't there. That is the omnipresence of the Lord. Um, the last one for his incommunicable properties is the omniscience of God. The omniscience of God, um, it's a trait that's closely linked with his omnipresence. So his omnipresence, he's everywhere. His um, om omniscient is, uh, is something different. Uh, because he's everywhere, uh, it's a big part in knowing everything. So that's what this word means. I'm not going to try to pronounce it again. Uh, it, it's that he knows everything. He's not just everywhere. Um, so in this one, we can see in uh, Job chapter... 34, verse 22. We can turn there for this one. Job 34, 22. The Bible says, There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. So this is saying that, um, you know, uh, to make a point about, about this here, uh, there's a lot of people that fret about uh, justice of God and God's not fair and why doesn't God do this and why doesn't God do that? Well, I covered in other points, you know, you're not going to constrain God by what you think is right and what you think is wrong. But God does, uh, the eyes of the Lord are, are beholding everything in the, in, in the earth. And um, it should be a, a thankfulness from you that uh, the Lord doesn't intervene the second something happens. Uh, or else we wouldn't be here right now. But, uh, you know, those who fret about uh, the just about justice, all about justice, justice, this, social justice, you know, whatever kind of justice you might be talking about, um, you know, the combined omniscience of God and his righteousness together, we'll, we'll hit the righteousness of God later. Uh, God knows everything. He knows every inner motivation of the heart that drives the actions uh, that and they cannot be hidden from God. He knows what's driving your, your actions, what, what, what you're doing, why you're doing it. Um, because God is perfectly righteous, he will deliver perfect justice as he knows exactly uh, how many counts of every charge somebody's guilty of. He knows how many times you've done this, X, Y, Z. Uh, thank God for the saved person that uh, God doesn't see our sin. Our sin is covered by the blood of Jesus, and uh, we don't have a sin account. But for somebody who's not saved, 
they have a full sin account. They have a whole rap sheet. And God knows how many times you've done X, Y, and Z uh, down to the T. And um, God is going to deliver his perfect justice one day. Um, Job chapter 42, we'll turn there since we're in Job already. Job 42, verse 2. Job 42.2 says, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. There you have it. God's even in your mind. He, he's in your heart. Um, not in your heart as, as, as you know, the saved people might, might say in the heart, but uh, God beholds what is in the heart. God weighs the heart, the Bible says, and uh, nothing can be withholden from thee. That's even the things that are in your heart, the hidden things in your heart. Uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36 says, Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So every word, every thought, every action, everything, uh, the Lord knows it. Um, even says that he knows, you know, the number of hairs on, on your head. So, um, you know, it could be, you know, talking about sin. It could be talking about creation. Uh, his thoughts for you are more than the, the sand on the sea. Nobody can number the sand on the sea, how many trillions of, of, of specks of sand that is, but uh, the Lord knows how many specks of sand there is down to the number, and uh, he, he, he knows everything because it's his creation. So we'll go down to the communicable attributes of God. Uh, these are things that are able to be conveyed in a way which we can understand. Um, these are attributes that, uh, you know, we can understand because he's created us with emotions and everything. Excuse me. And, uh, we can see, uh, the attributes of God based on what we know, uh, through, through, through this. So the first one is going to be, uh, uh, the righteousness of God. God is righteous. Uh, this is meaning that God is 100% fair and just. He is completely virtuous and morally right and morally correct. Um, he's not the new age politically correct God uh, that people are trying to preach and, and believe in now that, uh, you know, we'll hit it later if we have the time for it. Uh, he judges righteously, and in him is no darkness, the Bible says. Um, the unsaved man does not want to submit to the righteousness of God. Uh, they don't want to admit to the righteousness of God even. Uh, they want to put on their own self-righteousness and be good and on their own merit, aside from God, because once you recognize the righteousness of God and all that, you have to uh, subject yourself to that as that is the, that is the standard right there. Um, and we're called to be righteous um, as the Lord is. Um, uh, many deceived uh, people uh, who confess the name of Jesus. Uh, you can confess the name of Jesus, but... It's still possible to not be saved. Uh, I'm not getting. I'm not going to get into this whole thing about it. I gave another lesson about it, but um, there's a lot, the Bible says you know there's people that are going to do miracles and cast out demons in the name of of Jesus, and He's going to say, "Depart from me, I never knew you." Um, you know, you can have um, you can have all these things going on, but if you don't recognize and, and put on the righteousness of Jesus through His blood, um, you know, you might be in trouble there. Um, we may be able to put on the righteousness through God, but God is righteousness. So uh, we can put it on and, and we can have it, but God is always it. God is always righteous. There hasn't been a moment where God wasn't righteous. Um, no matter in what story you want to point out, um, where he's killed uh, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Even if, uh, if you do your math and you say there's millions on the earth during Noah's flood, and he killed them all, yeah. Well, he was righteous for it, the Bible says. There's nothing he's done that's unrighteous. Uh, Psalm chapter 116. Let's turn there. Oops, wrong way. Uh, Psalm 116, verse 5. The Bible says, Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. So here we have it. Gracious, righteous, and merciful. These things all seem to go together. 
Um, but just because the Lord is full of grace and mercy doesn't mean he is not righteous. Uh, and God's economy and way of doing, of doing business, um, it's, it's, it's an absolute miracle uh, because of the way he handles us. Uh, and it should be a constant praise and thankfulness, like I mentioned before, that uh, God is righteous and he would be righteous in dealing with us harshly, but he doesn't. He gives us mercy and grace. Uh, and that should be a, a constant thanks for us uh, towards him. Uh, Romans chapter 10, uh, 3 and 4 says, We are become the servants of righteousness, us who are saved. God is righteous, and we are now the servants of God, so we're the servants of righteousness. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 18 and 19 says, uh, Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to in iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield yourself members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. So we ought to be now uh, instruments of righteousness, as, as we're called to be. Um, getting a little pressed on time, we're not going to turn, but uh, Psalm chapter 145, verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways, and holy in all His works. Why do the righteous suffer? Um, would be a question. Uh, read Job. Uh, Job was called a righteous man, and, and, and he suffered. He suffered greatly. He suffered loss of many things, his family, his health, his wealth. Um, why is that? Uh, maybe just for the glory of, of the Lord uh, could, could be the reason. Uh, it, it's regardless of uh, circumstances. Um, this will not be different and not change. That uh, all, all things work together for the glory of God, for those that love him, the Bible says. Um, that's uh, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. Uh, we have God is merciful. Uh, Psalm, we're, we can turn there since we're open to it already. Psalm 103. Turn back a few pages. Psalm 103 verse 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Um, anyone who is honest can attest to the mercy of God. Um, the fact that even someone who would denounce the mercy of God and the goodness of God, it shows the mercy of God. Um, the fact that they can uh, draw breath to make that statement and that uh, God doesn't strike them down as they say it, that's the merciness of God right there. And uh, it reminds me of, of a point. Um, I'm not going to say the word. I'm not going to be the one responsible for shutting down the, uh, the stream here. But uh, somebody calls it the Skittles. Um, there's somebody that was bragging about the Skittles that they had, um, and they had all the different types of Skittles, and, and while she was on the stage boasting about it, she just fell over, collapsed, and she even used the word of uh, the name of God in there. It says, thank God, I think she said about that she has them all, or and then boom, she, she fell over. She didn't die, but you know the point's still there, that you can mock God and uh, you can heal over on the spot. Um, so, uh, God is merciful is the next one. Um, Psalm 103.8, read that one. Uh, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. Um, the difference between mercy and grace, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard the analogies of the difference between what is mercy and what is grace. Um, it, by grace we're saved, but... Mercy got us there. Um, grace is getting something that you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting something that you do deserve. Uh, that's the difference between the two there. They're linked kind of close together, but they're two separate things. And God is merciful in the way of dealing with us. Um, the same God uh, we've talked about this morning that is uh, grand and mighty, um, he's also very merciful and personal and compassionate. Uh, let's go back a few more Psalms to Psalm 86. Psalm 86, 
verse 15 says, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. So plenteous in mercy and truth. We know that God is truth. It's not just plenty. He's, he's infinite truth. Um, and then it also says on the same note there that he's plenteous in truth and mercy. So that's a lot of mercy that God's given if he's putting it on the same note as truth. And, um, you know, it, it's an amazing thing that this God that's almighty and all these attributes we're reading about him, that he can uh, come down to our level. He says that he's meek and lowly uh, 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 and that he can come down to our level. Um, it's amazing that, that God does all this for us. Um, God is love. This could be a whole one right here. Uh, uh, we, we hear about this a lot. Um, you know, save people walking in the spirit or save people walking in the world. Uh, Milksop Christians who aren't growing by the sincere uh, word of truth. Um, even many unsaved all will agree on this one point. Uh, it's probably one of the more agreeable points uh, of the Bible that, you know, God is love. And yes, God is love, but uh, uh, this is a, it's a twofold thing here. Um, definitely God is love. Uh, it's the whole story of the Bible is, is God's love for the Son, as, uh, as our pastor uh, tells us here. Um, it's true. The whole, the whole story here is, is, is God's love for His Son. And um, God is not a, a, a spineless, soft, effeminate God like um, a lot of churches try to make Him out to be now, uh, just like they try to make out His Son to be. Uh, and both, both aren't true. He, he, he's not some soft, jelly, wishy-washy kind of um, being. Uh, just because he's uh, compassionate and has a merciful side to him um, doesn't mean you just say that that's it and there's not this other side to him. Um, he's, he, he, he's all these things we're reading about today. He's, he's righteous and he's, he's just. And, um, the God is love message that is preached or just casually accepted, even if it's not preached, it's, it's just presented. Um, it's going to account for many people's false sense of salvation someday. Um, and that's going to have people end up in hell for not accepting the real sal uh, sal gospel of salvation. The Bible is very clear about what salvation is. And um, that is why we preach Christ crucified. That's why we preach heaven and hell. That's why we do what we do here. Um, and we don't just come up here and we say God is love and God loves you. Um, we're going to tell you what the Bible really says here. And um, another point to make here about God is love and uh, about salvation while I'm on it is um, I was going to make it for one of my points about uh, the, mer the mercifulness of God, but you cannot attribute uh, you know, God's mercy, God's love for pulling you out of a situation. Let's say you should have been in a catastrophic car accident that uh, you, you know, you, it's, a, it's a miracle that you walked away from it, or you did have a near-death experience and you got brought back, or you had some kind of a health scare, uh, whatever it may be. A lot of people, you know, uh, if you're a saved, discerned Christian and you hear that, and you say, oh, hey, you know, maybe the Lord was preserving you to be saved someday. Um, uh, they might say, oh, no, 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 uh, you know, I saw heaven, or no, no, God saved me uh, from dying. That means I'm saved, I'm, I have salvation. And that's, that's not what that is there. Um, you know, this, this, this love and mercy of God, uh, people will misattribute it uh, instead of saying, hey, you know, I have a whole bunch more chances of becoming saved. They'll think, oh, I got saved because of an experience. You got to watch out for experiences. Experiences are dangerous and um, experiences are something that's uh, destroying a lot of the church right now. Uh, it's, ex it's an experience, emotionally driven kind of event where uh, there's no truth um, in it. Uh, we're almost out of time here. I'm going to go through a few more. Uh, God is jealous. Uh, this seems to be a negative trait, although there's plenty of understanding about negative jealousy as us humans. Negative jealousy, negative envy even. Um, there's a place for positive um, jealousy. And uh, jealousy that's neutral without something attached to it can be good. You know, if you're jealous of your neighbor or you're jealous of this or that or the other, that's covetousness also in your heart. But the Bible says that God is jealous. And uh, God doesn't sin, so 
you can't have done a bad type of jealousy. Um, it's by the jealousy of God that he made a plan of salvation for us to be saved because he desires for us saints to be his fullness. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23. Uh, we saints are the fullness of, of God. Uh, Paul was jealous over his spiritual children. We see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, it says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Um, we can see here uh, godly jealousy. Um, in the same way that the Bible mentions righteous anger, the Bible doesn't say those words, righteous anger, but it's the same concept of um, you can have these attributes, uh, these characteristics used for the right thing. In the same way that a good, a good husband, a good father is going to be jealous over their family uh, to protect their family, uh, protect their wife, their child, um, that, that same kind of jealousy is kind of what God has here um, for us. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 5 says, Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Um, he, God is just wanting to protect what is His. Uh, he's bought us with the price, and uh, you know he, He's a good Father, so He's going to protect us. Um, and we can see here that this is where the chastisements of God come into play. Uh, God, the Bible says that um, um, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth, his, uh, chasteneth him betimes. So God loves us. He's going to correct us. Uh, that's the jealousy of God in action there when he chastises us when, when we're wrong. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 24 says for the Lord thy God is a consuming fire even a jealous God I'm not going to hit that point but the uh, Bible talks a lot about how um, how God is a fire a consuming fire I'm going to do a couple more small ones here bear with me I'm going to skim over them um, rather than make this into a part 2 uh, God is holy, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Um, anyone who's gotten saved can recognize this attribute of God. It's a key that we're able to be saved. We recognize our own sin and unholiness, recognize the holiness of God and Jesus. Um, even the unclean spirits recognize the holiness of, of God. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 24 uh, the unclean spirit uh, cried out, saying, um, the Bible says, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Yes, there's a study on God, but that was them talking about Jesus. But uh, I and my Father are one, Jesus says. Um, holiness is a complete absence of evil, sin, and unrighteousness. Uh, we'll go on to a couple more here. Uh, God is light. The Bible contrasts light and darkness in many places in many different ways. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, talking about the new heaven and the new earth, uh, says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. We're called to be uh, children of the light. That's First Thessalonians 5.5. 5. Um, we also see in Acts chapter 9 when Saul was on his way um, to Damascus that a uh, bright light shone down from heaven, it said, and a voice talked with him that was God, and he got blinded from it. Uh, his, his vision was blinded because God is light. Uh, God is a creator. I don't think we need to really delve into this one here. Uh, you know, we have Genesis 1. We have Job 38, verse 4. Uh, says, uh, God speaking, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Uh, Proverbs eight twenty seven. 27. Uh, when he pre prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Uh, that's wisdom. Wisdom was there with, with God. Um. An honest scientist will see evidence of creation everywhere and not make up a fairy tale 
rebellious uh, fairy tale, you know, to believe in instead. Um, even creation where, you know, they try to go through all the different levels of, of, of the fossils that are in the earth. They try to say, oh, you know, that's billions of years building up. Well, there's some Christian scientists that they uh, present a 100% clear picture that, you know, that the flood laid down uh, rapid levels of sediment. And uh, there's a lot you can look into that, that um, all these levels of, of, you know, different species and everything, it's very explainable uh, on, on, on the scale of, of creationism. There's a million things that disprove uh, evolution uh, and, the, and the flood being uh, one of them there, if you study it out correctly. But God as a creator and creationism, that's one of them. Um, so uh, God is a fire. We're not going to go over that one. God is wrath. God is a savior. God is a spirit. Uh, it's John 4, 24. If you want to look that one up, it says it explicitly. I'm going to go over one last point here and we'll, we'll be done for uh, Sunday school. Uh, God is a trinity. Uh, it might be obvious to us. Uh, it's not very obvious to some other people who try to make up some false doctrines of, uh, on the matter. Uh, one really cool thing is, is, uh, this miraculous miracle that's only found in the King James Bible um, to back up, you know, our, our Bible that, that we have here. Uh, there's a verse that's not found. Well, the verse is there, but they just muddied it up so much they cut out the whole entire verse to say something completely different. The verse that's in the exact middle, the verse that accounts for the exact middle point of the Bible is uh, 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. And... That verse says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So the exact middle of the Bible tells you who the author of the Bible is. And these new versions just say uh, there's somebody in heaven. That's like all that it'll say. They'll completely cut out what the, what the verse is saying. It'll take out, you know, how an artist signs their name on a painting. They try to cut out the painting, you know, the artist's name, and, you know, just to say, uh, you know, there is no real author of the Bible. Um, it's a really interesting study, um, and there's uh, some videos out there that can show you it. But if you go to the first verse of the Bible and the last verse of the Bible, which is Genesis 1-1, and uh, it's going to be uh, Revelation, uh, what's the last verse of the Bible? I don't want to say the wrong thing. Yeah, it's Revelation 22, 21. Um, Genesis 1, 1, if you do the math on it, numerology that's only found in the King James Bible, you're not going to find this in the Greek or the Hebrew or anywhere else. It's uh, the first verse has 10 words, 44 letters, 17 vowels, and 27 consonants, if you do the English grammar on it. The last verse of the Bible has 12 words, 44 letters, 17 vowels, 54 consonants. And um, if you go to the exact middle of the Bible, when you add up that first verse and the last verse, if you do the math on it, um, it adds up to 22 words, 88 letters, 34 vowels, and 54 consonants. The first and the last equals the middle. And that's pointing to exactly uh, who the author of the Bible is here. And it's pointing to the Trinity the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, these three are one. Um, that'll sum it up here. Uh, I want to make a point where, uh, you know, there's a word, uh, uh, you know, the word awesome. It's a word I've tried not to use too much in any other uh, re uh, regards. Because if you're in awe of something, if, you know, something that you're in awe of, it's something that's just grand. It's, it's majestic. It's, it's you're in awe. It's wow. Um, and you try to, you know, muddy down that word to something like, oh, hey, uh, found a hundred dollars on the floor. Oh, awesome. You know, that's not awesome. God is awesome. So I tried to personally reserve that word for just God. You know, when you read about his characteristics, uh, God is awesome. Um, many of these traits, I mentioned this verse before, it's Romans chapter one, verse 20. Um, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So this is saying, you know, saved or unsaved, everything points to God. All his attributes, everything that we've talked about today, 
nobody's going to be without excuse. All his creation is going to know, uh, does know already, whether they choose to ignore it or not, that uh, God is the author of all this here. Um, I'm way over time, so I won't make any more points here. Uh, let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you very much again for today. Thank you for helping me to uh, deliver this teaching. I pray that it uh, would have been a blessing to somebody here or somebody who's uh, going to watch the videos later. Uh, thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you uh, for your awesomeness. Thank you for all the characters that make you who you are. Um, just it's it's truly amazing when we study out who you are and don't take for granted uh, uh, who you are and your character, Lord. Um, I pray now that you bless the rest of today, uh, bless uh, the fellowship, bless the, bless the preaching, uh, bless the reading of your word, Lord. Uh, give us a good rest of our day here, and uh, we ask and pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord. Amen.